right. Good evening. evening. Thank you, Becky. Woohoo! And Jim, I appreciate you leading us. And uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I'm appreciative for uh, Charles filling in for me last week when I didn't know how I was going to feel, and uh, he did a great job always. And I saw, boy, they're really promoting you preaching over at Bethel in May in Ingleside. They're treating you like a celebrity, Charles. Uh, Brandon is so appreciative to have you come, and so we'll be praying for you while you go over there. He, he's already doing it. You're right. He's uh, doing a good job, and... Uh, He'll be an asset to that church and the community. All right. Well, tonight we'll be looking in Acts chapter 14, and uh, we'll look at that in just a moment. Know that uh, we're all watching the news uh, locally and uh, all across the country. There are all kinds of things to pay attention to in the world today. I'm just curious, some of you have traveled fur, further in time than I have, but was there ever a time in your life where you were not, or someone in your family was not concerned about local or world or political events? Some of you are saying yes, uh, <laughs> some of you are saying no, there's always something to be concerned about. Uh, we tend to remember the past better than it was. Uh, but I think we have so much news today, there doesn't seem to be a break. You know, we're, we're constantly inundated by things. So uh, my advice, as always, while you're praying and while you're thinking through things, remember to turn it off every now and then. Go for a walk. Take a nap is good advice. They've almost got the skate park finished at the park. Y'all go skating. When was the last time you went skating? Yes, I'm on the, I get a retainer from the ER here. <laughs> I just invested in a hip replacement company. <laughs> no, seriously, do something. Turn all that off every now and then. And uh, try to take a breath and remember that uh, our God reigns. Our God, you know, I don't know what else to say. Uh, okay, several things I know that we're praying about uh, among our own members, and uh, I'm going to open us in a word of prayer, and then we'll, uh, we'll begin our Bible study. So let's pray together. Lord, we, we want to confess, Lord, that uh, we are trying to be good stewards of our lives and to pay attention to what's going on in the world. And, we confess sometimes these things affect us deeply, emotionally, and uh, we're trying to make sense of things. We want to be a good witness, and we want to be those who will reflect your light into darkness. And so, Lord, help us. Help us as your people to take care of ourselves, to have a good and right biblical perspective on things. Help us to trust you in all things. Uh, we ask, God, that you would reveal yourself to our nation, that you would uh, turn people's hearts and eyes to you, and may Christ be revealed in our time and lives be changed. Lord, we pray for those in our church who, uh, who are on our prayer list and they're facing all manner of difficult things right now, cancer and uh, various medical procedures, some, Lord, are dealing with a emotional problems and uh, all kinds of anxiety. There are those who are in financial distress. Lord, I pray that you would provide for all of these needs, that you would show yourself to be great and mighty indeed, that you would uh, help people to know that you are close to them and that you care deeply for them. Lord, uh, we pray tonight again for Preston Simpson and his family. Ask God that you would heal his, his, his brain and reconnect all of those pathways so that uh, he can develop in a way that is right and good. 
Help him to get his strength and his appetite back. I pray that you would bless his parents uh, while they wait and see what you're going to do next. Uh, May your will be done. We bring these things, we lay them before you, God. We say that we trust you. Increase our faith and uh, reveal yourself to us as we study your word. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Hey, Joe. So, oh boy, that was a mistake. I put my glasses back on. There you go. So we're going to be in Acts chapter 14. Uh, we've been looking at Paul's first missionary journey. He is traveling with Barnabas. Uh, they were sent out by the church at Syria and Antioch. And so we've looked at a lot of different things that have transpired on this journey. And now tonight we're going to look at the end of the journey going to bring this to a close. All good things must come to an end, right? Even the first missionary journey. It seems like we've been talking about this for a month, and uh, we'll wrap it up tonight. Uh, I have a map of the first missionary journey, and uh, so so I would fail a map test, but tonight we're going to talk about uh, Iconium and Lystra and Derby. And their journey back, they, 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 they'll retrace their steps and then make their way back to, uh, to Antioch. Um, one of the things that's interesting about the text we'll look at in Acts 14 is the fact that this is the first time that we know of, at least in the book of Acts, where Paul and Barnabas will minister in a primarily pagan location where there's no Jewish, strong Jewish influence at all. And uh, some interesting things happen as a result of that. But uh, I don't want to spoil it for you. So let's look. Uh, The first thing we're going to see is that Paul and Barnabas begin their ministry in Iconium at the Jewish synagogue, and then a familiar pattern of acceptance and opposition develops. So let's look. Acts chapter 14. I'm going to start reading in verse 1. At Iconium... Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord, who confirmed the message of His grace by enabling them to do miraculous signs and wonders. The people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews, others with the apostles. There was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews, together with their leaders, to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country, where they continued to preach the good news. Um, In verse 5, what I... The NIV that I just read, it says there was a plot afoot. I'm curious. Instead of a foot, what does your Bible say? Does it say a foot? Oh, that's fabulous. I love that. There was a plot afoot. Okay, so here in uh, the first seven verses, uh, several things happen. First of all, Paul and Barnabas arrive in Iconium. They have the opportunity to speak in the synagogue and later throughout the city with displays of God's miraculous power. And as, as usual, there was some positive response followed by opposition from uh, unbelieving Jews. And we see the pattern here that we've seen other places in the book of Acts where they, uh, they, they, they go to the synagogues um, to, to uh, begin their ministry. Here, they're in the city of Iconium, which uh, had... A lot of different people that lived in that region of, uh, of, of Galatia. This would be uh, where modern-day Turkey is now. And uh, their ancestors were, uh, there were some Greeks, there would have been some Jews, and some Roman colonists who lived in this region. And uh, just a very strange mixture of people, of different cultures coming together. And they go first to the Jewish synagogue, as Paul has done in other places. Now, what do you remember? Why go to the synagogue first? What's the reasoning for Paul there? 
Okay, so Bill is saying theologically, uh, they're called the the Savior came to the the Jews first and to the Gentiles second, and that's a pattern Paul followed. That's pretty good. Why else? Why else go to the synagogue? All right, where in the Jewish culture that was the place, all everything centered around the synagogue. You were likely to catch everybody there, and not just the Jews, but who else might have been at the synagogue on the Sabbath? Yeah, yeah, the 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 God fearing Gentiles, proselytes to the faith, would have been there, and so this just is a natural place to come, and people who might have been open to the gospel message, and so. Paul, uh, that's where they go, and they have success, both among the Jews and the Gentiles. However, verse 2 points to a reaction from the non-believing Jews. Not only did they resist the missionaries' witness themselves, but they also, it says, poisoned the minds of the Gentile populace against the Christian witnesses. Have you ever poisoned someone's mind? Nobody here, surely. Well, what does that mean? It's a very graphic piece of language. What does that mean to poison someone's mind? All right. It's probably exerting some kind of influence in a way that's not good for the person and uh, maybe for everyone else too. Maybe uh, the idea is leading them astray, but uh, poisoning their mind, uh, helping them... Uh, distracting them and keeping them from hearing the truth and responding to it. But uh, how did Paul and Barnabas respond to the, the, the opposition? What does it say? They spent time, and he uses a word to describe their ministry, how they spoke. Boldly. Uh, they didn't back down. They didn't back down. In fact, they, they took their time. And they spoke boldly in the power of the Spirit to present the gospel, believing that people would respond, and they did. All right, in verses 4 through 7, we see that the city then becomes divided toward the apostles in their ministry, so they decided to go elsewhere. They were going to take their show on the road. Um, It says that the community becomes more and more polarized. Some were for the Jews, some were for the apostles, And that's never a good thing, this us versus them kind of thing, if that can be avoided. And opposition grew to the point that there was a plot afoot. And what was the plot? Yeah, they were going to do them harm, possibly stone them. All right. The the language that Luke uses here seems to indicate mob violence rather than any kind of official action. Uh, And elsewhere on this journey, there were officials in the communities that probably officially, on behalf of the state, took action against the apostles. That doesn't seem to be the case here. This seems to be more of a grassroots kind of effort. Anyway, Paul and Barnabas learned of the plot, and they head out to the countryside, to the villages of Lystra and Derbe and the surrounding region. All right, in the next passage that we'll read, we'll see that Paul and Barnabas' ministry in Lystra demonstrates how God's Kingdom purposes are often beyond our control or understanding, even to the point of our own suffering. So let's look. Acts chapter 14, I'll start reading in verse 8. In Lystra, there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, And called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting, Men, 
Why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. In the past, he let all nations go their own way, yet he, was, he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews from Antioch and Iconium and uh, then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city, thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and went back into the city. The next day, he and Barnabas left for Derby. All right, isn't that exciting? So in all my years of ministry, nothing like this has ever happened in any church I was at. What about you, Charles? You ever, are they ready to declare you to be Zeus? Yeah, so here's what happens. In verses 8 through 10, we see that Paul heals a man who was born lame. Uh, he had been lame from birth, and Paul recognizes something about him, and then this miracle transpires, and the man gets up, and he walked about uh, after he had been healed. What, what does Luke tell us that Paul noticed in the man before the healing? He had faith. A glimmer, some sort of glimmer of faith. What did Paul see, I wonder? Do you have any thoughts? What would you even look for? He was listening. That's a good sign. <laughs> That's always a good sign. Yeah, we don't know. But something in, in observing him, the Spirit moved in Paul's heart to know this guy's ready. And, uh, and so Paul commanded him to get up and walk, and immediately uh, he was healed. Um, now here there's no mention of the name of Jesus or the power of God, but as has happened elsewhere in the book of Acts, we know that Paul probably was proclaiming the gospel. The man heard the name of Jesus and believed uh, and then had the faith to be healed and that it was God's power who healed him. We've seen also in the book of Acts that often when Paul would preach, he would also have the opportunity to give displays of God's miraculous power and people were healed and other things would happen. And the healings, you remember, that was never the point. The point was to demonstrate that God was present and to help bolster the gospel message that the apostles were preaching and people came to believe as a result of that. All right. In verses 11 through 13, we see that the people of Lystra misinterpret the miraculous healing in light of their pagan beliefs. Here, there's no mention of any Jewish synagogue in Lystra. Uh, there's no archaeological evidence either that a synagogue existed from this time period. By and large, Lystra seems to have consisted primarily of Gentiles who were pagans, and their reaction to the lame man's healing reflects their background. So how did they explain the healing of the lame man? All right. The gods have come down in human form. It's the only explanation, right? It's reasonable. If that's the only thing they knew of God and supernatural powers and healing and all of that, you can understand how they reached that conclusion. And then as a result of understanding that the gods had come here, uh, what where did they decide they would do in response to the presence of the gods? Yes, sacrifice. Not sacrifice the gods, but sacrifice bulls or something to the gods. All right, and who did they call Paul? Who did they think he was? Hermes, uh, the messenger of the gods. Um, and Barnabas, they thought, was who? Zeus, the chief god. Uh, why didn't they think Paul was the chief god, Zeus? Yeah, because yeah, because Paul did all the talking, and Hermes apparently was quite verbose. But I also think that Paul was probably an ugly little man, and Barnabas was tall, and uh, probably very impressive. 
And so surely Zeus had to be the more impressive one of the two. Um, It's also interesting that as they were reaching these conclusions about who was in their midst, that uh, they were speaking in their own language. And therefore, Paul and Barnabas had no idea what was going on. Have you ever been in a group of people who were talking and you had no clue? Yeah. And uh, (laughs) that's been quite alarming for Paul and Barnabas. Okay. In verses 14 through 18, we see that Paul and Barnabas make a fruitless attempt to keep the crowd from worshiping them as God. Somehow, they, they... They realized what was taking place. And when they became aware, how did Paul and Barnabas respond? Uh, They tore their clothes and rushed into the crowd to try to intervene. Why the tearing of their garments? Okay. Okay. The tearing of clothes could have been in response to blasphemy. Why else would a Jewish person, a man especially, have torn his clothes? Sign of grief, uh, just an expression of great emotion. But uh, generally, especially in the New Testament, we have examples of it being a response to blasphemy. Grief over the blasphemy that I've just heard. And so Paul and Barnabas uh, express this great emotion. They do not want to be worshipped as gods. Do you remember what happened to uh, the, uh, the the governor? Uh, holy, I just I just completely forgot his name. Uh, Herod, Herod, when he allowed the people to think that he was divine, what happened to him? Yes, uh, it says that he was eaten from the inside out with worms from God's judgment. Uh, I think Paul and Barnabas were aware of that and probably didn't want anything like that to happen to them. So uh, they tell them, we too are only men, human like you, and they, uh, they try to stop the, uh, the, whole pr- the whole process where these guys would be worshipped or honored by these locals in such a way. It, it seems to be human nature that we want gods that we can touch and talk to and interact with and uh, maybe even control. And so throughout human history, we've created gods in the likeness of humans. And holy men in every age have succumbed to the temptation to be venerated as gods. There are countless examples throughout history. And even in today's world, some of the holy rollers that are out there are almost treated like a deity, and they're given great wealth and honor. My own experience, one time we were, in, uh, we were in New Mexico at a place where they were doing an intertribal ceremony, and so Native Americans had come from all over the country to participate in a rodeo and the ceremony there. They were having a parade, and Kim and I were handing out flyers to invite people to a, a, a barbecue at the, at the church there in town later on. And so uh, as we were handing out the flyers to the people that were at the parade, the the Native Americans, one of them asked who I was, and Kim explained to them that I was a pastor. And uh, when they realized that, they asked me if I would pray for them. And so uh, I said, yeah, we we, we went over to the side of the road there where it wasn't very crowded, and, uh, and I started to pray for them. And I could feel people putting their hands on me while I was praying. And then when I said amen and I looked up, there was this crowd of people around me and they were all trying to get as close to me as they could and to to touch me. And I thought, um, well, first I thought, I'm very uncomfortable. (laughs) You know, don't touch me. But I realized that they had great reverence for me and for what I represented. And it was not disrespectful at all. They were just trying to get as close to me as they could. And in getting close to me, maybe they would draw closer to God himself. And so there's, there's, this seems to be something in human nature. Yeah, Bill? Missionaries. Yeah, it, it's it probably pretty common. So Bill is saying 
that when we send missionaries overseas, they might have similar experiences as well, and uh, the Lord drawing people to them. And I think that's probably, probably true. Once uh, Paul and Barnabas had gotten the crowd's attention, they, they, uh, they didn't miss the opportunity, or I should say Paul didn't miss the opportunity to preach a little mini-sermon to them. <laughs> they were all there, and they, he had a captive audience, and so he told them some things. We, we believe this is the first, well, it is the first sermon in Acts to be delivered purely to a pagan group. These are people with no exposure to Judaism or the history of the Jewish people or the Jewish scriptures or anything like that. And so Paul, is he's uh, plowing new ground here. And so what he has to say to them is pretty significant. And they have to go back to the very beginning, not with the coming of Christ, but with the whole idea of there being just one God, period. I mean, they're going all the way back to some very foundational kinds of things. And so uh, Paul's introduction to the sermon had to do with the vanity of their worship. Any religion is pretty empty that would venerate men as gods. And so he's telling them not to to worship or to pursue these worthless, these vain things. And instead, let me tell you about the one true God who is worthy of your worship, the source of all that truly lives. And this was the, 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 the main point of Paul's message, telling them about the living God. And Paul says three important things about God. Can you see them in his little sermon there? He says three important things about God. All right, uh, he's the creator of all life, the heavens, the earth, all that's in them, the seas, the skies. So he is the creator, the maker of all things. All right, what else does he say? All right, he, he, his second point deals with God's forbearance and mercy, his, his demonstrations of kindness. In former generations, Paul says, God allowed the Gentiles to go their own way and to live their own lives. Uh, the implication is that their deeds were done in ignorance. But now, Paul is saying, I'm telling you the truth. Before, you may have had reason or an excuse for your sinful pursuits. But now I'm going to tell you something that's going to change everything. And uh, before, they had no revelation from God. But now they are going to have the opportunity to hear about and respond to the one true God. Uh, maybe the implication is before, maybe they wouldn't be held accountable for their sin, but now after hearing the gospel message, they will have been, they will be accountable. But then Paul gives one more point. What's the third thing he tells them? Do what? Yeah, so... Even though you haven't had a direct revelation from God, Paul says, you're still not without excuse because God has borne witness to himself through nature, what we call general revelation or the natural revelation. Uh, he sent rain to you. He didn't have to, but he did. Uh, he allowed your crops to grow and to flourish. He gave you fruitful harvests. Uh, you experienced joy in your hearts. He, uh, he said all of that, is, uh, is a sign that God is with you. And later in Romans, Paul will develop this idea even more to say that uh, you, you're not without excuse, the pagans, the Gentiles, because God has revealed himself in nature. There's enough in nature for us to see or to recognize the presence of God or the handiwork of God and to want to know more about God. Now, I've talked before, especially if you took that theology class with me, that uh, I don't believe that you can come to saving faith in Christ through nature alone. That sooner or later there has to be a gospel presentation where someone tells you the name of Jesus and what Jesus did for you. And uh, the, the natural, natural or general revelation gets us close to God but can't take us all the way. We still need people to hear and respond to the gospel message and to the name of Christ. But, yeah. Yes. 
Becky's saying it's significant that he used the term living God when talking about the Lord and then about Jesus, that uh, they would have been used, especially if there was a temple of Zeus there, there would have been a statue of Zeus, but it's just a statue, a dead piece of, uh, piece of rock or stone, worthless, vain, empty, he says. But I'm going to tell you about the living God. That's right. So he uses this nature to build a bridge with them to help them to see uh, the truth of God and maybe to be able to accept it uh, because of what God has revealed about himself in nature. But it's an incomplete sermon. He didn't get a chance to bring his sermon in for a landing. We know that because Luke doesn't record anything of the gospel message or about Jesus Christ. Verse verse 18 indicates that the sermon was cut off. The crowd was still intent on sacrificing to the apostles. And uh, they apparently were so impressed by the healing of the lame man that they didn't want to hear a sermon. They just wanted to offer the sacrifice, right? Uh, Anyway, that's what happens. All right, verses 19 through 20 The Jews from Antioch and Iconium catch up with the apostles in Lystra, inciting the city to acts of violence against Paul. Uh, We don't know about the time period here, but apparently after this event, the apostles worked for a while in Lystra. Uh, We we think that their ministry was, was relatively fruitful because Luke mentions in verse 20 that there were disciples there. And so there were some who came to faith in this village and were being taught or discipled by Paul and Barnabas. But as time went on and the Jews uh, from these other villages came and incited the people against Paul and Barnabas, they, took, they, uh, they became violent, uh, mob violence. And so what did they do to Paul? Yeah, they drug him outside of the city And uh, there they stoned him and left him there thinking that he was dead. Why wasn't Barnabas stoned? Yeah. Because Paul was doing all the talking. That's probably right. We're going to make this guy be quiet (laughs) once and for all. We just don't know. Maybe Paul was off somewhere. I mean, Barnabas was off somewhere doing something else and wasn't present when it happened. Uh, Maybe the real threat was Paul. We just don't know. Uh, some of the disciples then come out, and it says that they maybe encircled Paul's body. Uh, we don't know really what was going on there, and we don't know what they did while they were out there. Did they pray over him? Did they uh, some, do something to refresh him? Uh, did God perform a miracle there and bring him back from the dead? We just don't know. Chances are Paul will only appear dead, uh, severely wounded. And they prayed over him and then were able to get him to his feet where he uh, went back into the city. And then in verses 20 and 21, we see that Paul and Barnabas depart for Derby. I got to say that uh, being stoned almost to death probably means your ministry there is over. It's time to move on. And that's what Paul and Barnabas did. They didn't linger in Lystra. It wasn't safe for them, and so they set out for Derby. It would have taken several days to reach Derby on foot. Luke gives just the essential details that it was, uh, they arrived there. It was a successful witness. Uh, Many disciples were one to the Lord. And Paul and Barnabas then turn from Derby and then begin to retrace their steps. And so that's the last thing I want us to cover tonight, the end of their journey. So Paul and Barnabas conclude the first missionary journey by returning to strengthen the believers in the communities they had visited. So let's look at Acts 14, starting in the second part of verse 21. It says, They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church with prayer and fasting, committed to them to the Lord, uh, committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. 
After going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, where they had preached the word in Perga. And, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From Italia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they stayed there a long time with the disciples. All right. So here, uh, what Luke tells us is pretty straightforward. Uh, First of all, Paul and Barnabas revisit the new churches they had established. They encouraged them, continued to make disciples, and provided leadership for these churches. And uh, Luke tells us that they did at least uh, three important things in each church they revisited. What did they do? Strengthen the disciples. Okay. Good. What else? All right. They appointed leaders. And at least one more thing. They encourage them to remain true to the faith. There's going to be hardships. You've got you to gotta stay the course. Stay the course. So, first, they strengthen the disciples. That probably refers to uh, more teaching or training, uh, helping them to understand the scriptures, that sort of thing, encouraging them uh, to remain true to the faith. It's the second thing that they did, and they pointed out the many hardships they might encounter for bearing the name of Jesus. Uh, Later in his letter to the Corinthians, Paul is going to go through a list of things. This happened to me, and this happened to me, and this happened to me. And i got to tell you, I don't want any of that to happen to any of us, the things that Paul went through. However, several places in the New Testament tell us that we should expect hardships when coming, you know, when, when we are following Christ. And that's what Paul and Barnabas tell uh, these churches here. And I think they wanted them to expect, especially as the church grew in the midst of a pagan culture, that uh, there would be pushback. Finally, the ministry of the apostles was to establish leadership in these new congregations. Uh, Luke talks about they would pray and they would fast, this idea of seeking the Lord and then setting aside uh, elders in these churches, probably following a Jewish format, because this is what happened in, in Jewish communities and the synagogues. They would appoint elders or elect elders to kind of give guidance to the religious community. And Paul and Barnabas seem to be following that same pattern. But these are probably men at this time who could carry or bear the weight of the church, who could bear the weight of the responsibilities for these new believers. And Paul and Barnabas, and really the churches, entrust them with that weight, with that responsibility. Now, we don't have time, and I have little interest, but if we wanted to store up, uh, stir up a hornet's nest, we could talk about who appointed the leaders in these churches. Who do you see as doing that? Paul and Barnabas did. Uh, there's no indication that the churches had any say in the matter. What do you think about them apples? <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. Now, as Baptists, we say no to that. It's not our form of government. Elsewhere in the book of Acts and in the New Testament, you get a sense that the churches had more of a congregational kind of format with one another. But here, it seems to have been Paul and Barnabas under the Lord's leadership and maybe along with the, the church praying and fasting. But they, who the leaders, the elders should have been, became apparent. And uh, they set these men aside to fulfill that role. All right. Verses 24 through 25, Luke describes the journey through the lowlands uh, and the ministry that was performed there. They retrace their steps. And then in verses 26 through 28, we see that after returning to Syrian Antioch, from where they had been called out, they made a report to the church that sent them on the first missionary journey. And uh, they gave this full account of themselves 
and of the work that God did opening this door of faith to the Gentiles, Luke describes, and it says that Paul and Barnabas spent some time there among the disciples. Okay, this is a high point in the ministry of the early church, and certainly in Paul and Barnabas' lives, the end of the first missionary journey, God opening the door for the Gentiles to come to faith in Christ, the spread of the gospel message, uh, the persecution that they experienced. All of that was pretty significant. Chapter 15 is going to describe conflict within the larger Christian church, and you have the Jerusalem Council. So we'll talk about that next week. But uh, the fact that God was doing this extraordinary work among the Gentiles was not going to sit well with everyone in the church. So we'll talk about that another time. All right, I want to end with two closing thoughts. First of all, I think we should expect that there will always be opposition or at least resistance to any gospel proclamation and to the presence of God's kingdom. I think we should expect this, no matter where we are in the world, even here in good old Christian Aransas County, there will always, always be opposition and resistance uh, to the gospel and the presence of God's kingdom. Even in your own families, there will always be resistance and pushback not only to the name of Jesus, but to the presence of God's work in your own lives. And people will not always understand that. I can't explain it. All I can tell you is that we need to learn something from Paul and Barnabas. Like the words of the, uh, the wise Kenny Rogers, sometimes you have to know when to hold them and know when to fold them. And there are times, I think, in ministry when it's right to stay the course and to stand up and to stay put and to continue to express the truth to people, even in bold ways. There are other times when I think it's right and good to trust the Lord and to, uh, to head out into the countryside. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? There's no science here. It's all just depending on the situation and how the Lord leads. And even in your own families, that's going to be true. There's going to be sometimes around the Thanksgiving table where it's going to make sense to say, no, wait a minute. Let's talk about this. And there's, a, there's going to be other times where it'll make sense to let it go and to trust the Lord. Uh, knowing when, that, when, when it is, is, uh, is I don't know, I don't know. Anybody else have wisdom on that? You know when it is? <laughs> well, you depend on the Holy Spirit for sure. And I think having, having the faith, especially to know when to let it go, can be a, a very challenging thing, especially in families. All right, one more thing. What appears to be defeat and failure is often reversed in God's kingdom into something quite different. What I want to tell you is that it seems the whole account in Lystra can be very discouraging, and it may seem like everything was for naught, and that, and that all that Paul got for his trouble was being stoned almost to death. But I want to tell you that one of the converts from Lystra would be Timothy. And Timothy would go on to be whom Paul describes as a beloved and faithful child in the Lord, who slaved in the gospel with him, according to Philippians 2.22. Uh, had not Paul endured everything he did in Lystra and stayed the course, maybe Timothy and his family would never have come to faith then we would never have the book of Timothy, either one of them, which are two of my favorite books in the New Testament. I cannot tell you how many times over the course of my, my walk with Christ, especially in my ministry, that God has used First and Second Timothy as an encouragement to me. It wasn't all for nothing, what Paul endured there. It has great meaning, at least to me. And I tell you, as I was studying and, and as I came to that realization, this week, I wept, you know, just very, I'm sorry for what Paul endured, but I'm thankful because it did bear fruit, and it's still bearing fruit even in my life today, hopefully yours as well. So it's more evidence of Romans 8.28 being true, that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, 
who have been called according to his purpose. Uh, Paul probably would have preferred not to go through all of that, but it wasn't for nothing. It wasn't for nothing. And I wonder if we could be able to allow the Lord to shift our perspective. And again, I don't want to minimize anything that we go through in our lives. Some things are hard and painful, but maybe it's not for nothing. I don't know that we'll see this grand meaning, but maybe we will on the other side. Some things will become clearer to us on that day. All right. You have any concluding thoughts tonight? All right. Oh, Casey has a question. Yeah. So Casey's asking about when they left Lystra and then they, they on their return journey, they go back through there, of course. And Luke doesn't record any controversy or any drama that occurs as they repeat that journey and go through that place where their lives were in such danger. Uh, it is my thinking that Luke had a way of minimizing quite a bit in order to move the story along. And especially just in these verses, how much is Luke not saying about what takes place? Uh, he wanted them, Luke's point is to get them back to Syria and Antioch and to talk about their report. And so maybe there's just some things he's not mentioning. Uh, it could be that the Spirit went before them and, uh, and made a way. And so there was nothing to report. Uh, I really don't know. I like to think that the, the Lord had his hand on them as they went and just made a way and protected them along the way. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, something miraculous had to have happened. Um, yeah, I agree, I agree. Charles, you, you were going to say? So Charles is tracing back the, the Jews that stirred up the trouble likely were some who uh, claimed faith in Christ from the Judaizer party. And uh, while they had a very interesting view that Paul will fight against about how to be Christian, they definitely claimed to be. And yet they incited violence against Paul and uh, opposition to Paul and Barnabas in their ministry. And you use the word inconsistent, <laughs> which is an understatement, which you're a master at. So, yeah, it does Doesn't seem right. Evil people. Interesting. That is interesting. Maybe so. It, and so Jim is wondering what would motivate the Jews to continue to keep track of where Paul and Barnabas were and to follow them, you know. What what was it that they took personally and not get over Paul turning his back on them and leaving them or whatever. 
I think possibly it's just that they didn't like that man. They did not like Paul. <laughs> he was not a likable guy. And what he had to say was offensive, was a threat to them. And uh, that needed to be addressed as well. So I don't know. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's pray and we'll be done. Lord, I ask that you would uh, prepare us to be your, your people in the midst of the times in which we live, in this place, among the people we share life with, especially our families. We want to be a good witness uh, in all the ways that that might take place. And so help us to understand that uh, there might always be opposition or resistance, even among those who are close to us. And when that comes, I pray, you'd help us to remember that they're resisting or opposing you and not us necessarily. And help us to be wise about knowing how to stand our ground, and how to speak the truth, and then maybe also to know when to be quiet and to let things go and to trust you. Um, that you care even more deeply than we do for those who are lost. So I pray that you would give us wisdom and patience and discernment through the presence of your Spirit and knowing how to be witnesses in our time and in our circles of influence. And Lord, I ask also that you would remind us that the difficulties that we endure aren't for nothing. They are not meaningless, especially when it comes to uh, suffering for our faith in Christ or enduring hardships in the name of Christ. Timothy was greatly impacted by Paul's ministry. And I'm thankful for that. And I'm going to try to trust you with my own hardships. That uh, you will bear fruit in your own way and in your own time. But give us the grace to endure. Sustain us, Lord, from one day to the next. And may your will be done. I pray, Lord, that you would bless those who are gathered here. Pray that you would bless those who are watching online. May uh, your will be done in their lives. Protect them, provide for them, comfort them with your presence. And Lord, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.